was really fantastic and insightful and informative. Thank you all. And Becca, great job moderating. Um, I'm really excited about this next panel. It is actually one of my favorite topics. It's about achieving um, access for all, so health equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it's my honor to have my friend, my colleague, and my neighbor, Ms. Marion Jones, moderate this session. So Marion, come on up. And then we'll also be joined by Dr. Jaime Amatola from UConn Health, Dr. Nikte Mejia from Mass General Hospital, uh, Joe Lee, Jolanda Ross, who's an NMOSD patient, come on up. And we have a very special guest who traveled all the way from Mexico to to be here with us today, please join me in welcoming Natalia Del Rinson, who is here from Mexico. Bienvenido. So I think it's safe to say that I can skip the intro part because you are quite familiar with me. Yes? Four people are? OK, five. All right, so, so I am um, really just uh, excited as well to be a part of this panel discussion uh, to moderate, um, to share the platform with some pioneers that have did some extraordinary work in this industry around diversity and equity and inclusion uh, in the space. Um, I feel like I'm kind of in a Nobel Peace Prize um, you know, there's some people that are not looking directly up at me. Oh, they're looking up now that I just feel honored to even be in the, the room with. So first of all, thank you so much for just being here, um, for spending your time with us, spending the day with us, coming all the way from Mexico to join us, and um, really looking forward to um, the remarks and the information that you're going to contribute to this panel. Um, so first, we'll just start with uh, just having you introduce yourself. Um, for the patients that are on the panel, um, you know, introduce yourself, share where you're from, your diagnosis, and just uh, a little bit about your diagnosis, you know, kind of the time frame of uh, being diagnosed. And uh, Jolie, since you've introduced yourself, maybe you can also include maybe something, uh, an interesting fun fact that we don't know. Uh, and, then, um, and then we'll just have the doctors that are joining us on the panel to um, introduce yourself by name, uh, where you're from, maybe where you are um, working, and just a little bit about um, your background. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalia, but everyone calls me Nat. I'm from Mexico. I was diagnosed in January 2023, so a year ago, with NMO. And actually, my first symptom was on December 2022, the day I, I was graduating. So yeah, I first thought it was stress. But then we went to the hospital in Mexico City. And I spent there two months, almost two months. And I couldn't see, I was blind, and then I lost all my mobility. And I've been having uh, physical therapy since then for like three, four hours per day. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jolanda Ross, um, NMOSD patient, diagnosed in March 2020 with aquaporin 4 positive. Um, I don't know. I don't really have any fun facts. <laughs> That'd be an interesting fact then. Interesting. Um, I just, I have two sons. My oldest will be 28 in September and my youngest will be um, 25. So they're three years apart. <laughs> Thank you. And I didn't plan it that way. They're two weeks apart, September 10th and September 27th. So. <laughs> That's a fun fact. It's wonderful to be here today. Nick de Mejia. I'm a neurologist, movement disorder specialist at Mass General Hospital, and I lead our departmental community health diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm Jaime Mitola. I'm the chief of neuroimmunology at UConn Health, and I am a teacher. I'm a scientist and take care of patients with NMO and uh, MS and MOGAT. Thanks. Thank you. So I think the first question that I have, you know, we talk about health equity and access to care. Um, to the doctors that are on the panel, I just want to ask you, you know, do you think that uh, every patient has 
access to quality health care, regardless of their socioeconomic status, uh, their location? And if not, what do you perceive to be, um, you know, some of those barriers that are at play? And, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you do to, to eradicate those barriers that are at play? Right. Thank you for that question. Structural racism is very real, right? Opportunities, resources. Uh, some people have more than others. And it's our duty to be really thoughtful about how does that intersect with this community and access to care. Um, a few years ago, Altaf Saadi, uh, one of the neurologists at Mass General and I, um, were asked, well, what if the problem is that people don't have access to a neurologist? You know, if people had access to a neurologist, they would get a diagnosis, they would get a treatment plan. How often is it that people can't see a neurologist? And we use national data, uh, so this is US data, uh, um, um, medical expenditure panel survey. It has people all over the country, regardless of their type of insurance, and it has a lot of information. And with that data, we understood that the gaps are real. If you identify as black or Latino in the US and have a known neurologic condition, you're 30 to 40% less likely to be seeing a neurologist in a clinic. Now, people need care, and oftentimes what we found in that study is that people ended up seeing neurologists in the emergency room or as inpatients, and the cost for that was actually higher. Um, one additional barrier was insurance. If people were uninsured, they were 60% less likely to see a neurologist. And so when you think about the pathways and actions that this community can take, it's really important to understand that we're far behind other countries in things like universal health care. And all of you here have a voice in, in making this change. You know, we take for granted Medicare. And for my patients with Medicare, there's so much they can have access to. Uh, Medicare didn't exist a few decades ago. It was people like you here who advocated for it happening. And so I think today, it's our duty to advocate on how can we make Medicare better for people who are Medicare eligible, and how can we expand that access to healthcare so that that isn't one barrier that people face. But that, that is one of, of many barriers. Beyond that, if you get to a clinic, the question is, are you getting there in time? Right? There's a lot of biases and barriers that prevent people from getting a, a, a diagnosis on time. And then are you having access to the right tests and the right treatments? So there's a lot that we need to do um, in different spheres. But I, I do think that the first part, those big structural barriers like access to insurance, um, we all can do something about today. Uh, Thank you. I'm just going to add, uh, excellent. Um, you know, I'm going to bring these comments to NMO and mock AD, um, because as a practicing neurologist, I can see that every single day in my clinic. Um, I have his stories after stories of patients that are diagnosed, uh, African-Americans or Hispanics, that are diagnosed with uh, NMO, and they have a delay between the diagnosis and treatment. And the delay can be all, all the way from six months to almost a year. And that is unsustainable for our patients because the um, increased um, morbidity and mortality and disability that you can acquire in NMO and mock AD is substantial compared to MS, right? So the question is, we know that. I mean, there is a, a lot of uh, studies after studies that uh, actually show the problem. We know what the problem is. The question is, what are we gonna do to try to solve the problem? Because we have uh, engaged since 2008 when the WHO defined what social determinants of health were for global health, right? So there are three goals, and the first and the second goals are basically political goals. You know, I'm not a politician, I'm a, I'm a physician. But the third goal is achievable by communities. So the fact that we have the Somaya Foundation, the fact that we have other foundations or other organizations building communities, that's the first step in order to change the, the structural barriers that we have. So I think that uh, this is a, a, a high time for us, and I, I'm very happy that you're here. So the question is, how can we structure better approaches to delivery of care? And that's what we do 
and in clinic, and that's what we do in our institutions. And by the way, the fact that you all are here helping each other, that's an insubstantial prog progress toward this goal. Thank you. I want to turn it over to the patients now. And um, you said you go by, is it Nat. Nat? OK, I was going to say Natalia, but Nat. So just from a patient perspective, can you talk to us about your experience with getting diagnosed? And I was talking to your mother earlier, and she shared that you actually had to travel somewhere else to get care and live there for a year. Uh, so being away from home. So tell us about that process and, and, you know, what that was like, you know, just having to uproot just because access to care wasn't where in your in your area where you lived. Yeah, well, my experience is with the private care system because, unfortunately, in Mexico, we don't have a really good public one. I don't think that's a secret. But the private one is really good, but not in every city. So... It's mostly in the big cities like Mexico City, Monterrey, Guadalajara. They are the main ones. So I live in a quite big city called Leon in the middle of the country. But I didn't receive the care. They were just suggesting different things. And my mom actually was the one who decided to go to Mexico City to seek for another doctor. And I think we got there in the right time because we found an expert in NMO in Mexico. But yeah, I had to move for a year and live in Mexico City. And actually right now, even though I'm back in Leon, I still have to go once a month for a week to see doctors and to see my therapist and everything in Mexico City. Thank you for sharing that, Nat. Jolie, um, what about you? If you could kind of speak to maybe some challenges that you've um, experienced or any barriers that you think are linked back to um, equity or inclusivity or, or any of that. Um, well, I do have really good health insurance and I live in Boston, which is one of the best cities for, you know, to live in with any type of disorder or disease. <laughs> Um, I do have one experience as far as like, um, I guess, cultural competency, maybe unconscious bias. When I was having a relapse, I had severe pain in my head. My son took me to the ER and I was checked in, you know, obviously crying and a lot of pain and um, a Caucasian doctor came up and said, oh, okay, I'll give you Tylenol. Like, do you think I came here to pay this <laughs> amount of money to the ER <laughs> for Tylenol? And um, before I even had the chance to argue with him, I mean, keep in mind that I'm in, in a lot of pain, uh, an Indian doctor walked up right behind him and said, no, give her fentanyl. I have never been so happy to see a person of color in my life. Like, <laughs> It's like, I mean, I don't, you know, obviously we all know that they, um, for some reason, think black people can take more pain or exaggerate, especially when it comes to women. So I just really don't know what was going through that. The first doctor's mind when he suggested Tylenol, which I obviously took at home, but, um, you know, maybe there does need to be more training as far as like unconscious bias goes and like cultural competency as when, you, you know, for doctors, um, I think that will go a long way. So. so that's a, um, thank you both for sharing your stories. That's a great segue to some questions that I have for the doctors. Um, how are you, I say, working to advance uh, maybe equity through patient care and research? I know you're doing uh, some incredible things in your, in your line of work. So if you could speak to that. Sure, I think it takes a village. So it's it's more than the doctors inside the walls of a clinic. It's those doctors stepping outside of the walls and really engaging with the broader community and thinking of how can we partner to make meaningful change. Um, in, in, in specifically related to access, one of the things that Mass General um, is very involved in, and Dr. Matielo actually leads this effort, um, there is a large teleneurology network in the Northeast 
where we are supporting uh, physicians in community hospitals, uh, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. So if you end up in an emergency room where there's not a neurologist or in an inpatient ward where there's no neurologist, odds are they may be partnering with us to bring that neurology service there to help understand what's going on with someone's symptoms, put together a treatment plan, see if that's the right place for them, if there's things that are missing there that could be available somewhere else. I think that structurally um, has helped broaden access. Um, within the Wild Software Clinic, there's a lot to be done. Something that hasn't been mentioned, and I'll touch upon that, is language differences. In the United States, we speak hundreds of different languages, and this is growing. Our population here in Massachusetts is very linguistically diverse. And if you, if you touch upon gaps in the quality of care, one is language differences. So we do need a more linguistically diverse clinical workforce uh, that can understand and, and be more sensitive to the needs of their patients. Um, there's a lot of efforts on diversifying the workforce, including in our Department of Neurology at Mass General, but also training that next generation to speak other languages. For example, at Harvard Medical Schools, there, there's medical Spanish, medical Portuguese, medical French, and so on that the medical students can take. And then finally, any hospital that receives federal funds has an interpreter services office. And so teaching physicians how to partner with interpreters to give patients the best access to that linguistic care is also something that, that we're very proud to be doing. Great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. Pause. <laughs> I, I'm going to uh, touch on a couple of things that actually your story is actually brought up. is the issue of awareness and agency and uh, how to empower patients. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about these problems. And at the end of the day, I have come to the conclusion that one of the best strategies is empowering the patient uh, and, aware and awareness. Um, you know, uh, awareness change outcomes. And awareness doesn't mean uh, more than be a um, compassionate person that deliver education to the patient, right? Um, I think that nobody here is an expert in any disease, right? Until you get diagnosed with breast cancer, you become an expert in breast cancer, right? So my point is that um, we assume, and this is the point of awareness also in the position of the doctors. Uh, since 1929, when the Flexton Report came came out, um, we am, we're putting a lot of emphasis in the biological model of taking care of patients, and we're forgetting the biopsychosocial aspect of taking care of medicine. There is an erosion of compassion. And you know, this is not a, uh, it's, it's not a mystery. You can read it in everywhere. Uh, there is a lot of bias, implicit bias. I have tons of stories to tell you about my own perception of bias. And uh, my experiences with microaggressions, bias, racism, et cetera. But the point is that we need to overcome that and become agents of change, right? So how do you do that? Well, you need to find people that can educate you. As I mentioned to you in the beginning, you're not an expert of any disease until you're diagnosed with that disease. And then you, you go to Dr. Google first, and Dr. Google tells you a lot of stuff. But actually, you're not, they, Dr. Google doesn't know you. Your doctor knows you, right? So my point is that patient education uh, at the level of personalized patient education is important. Now, awareness. So what does that mean? Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, to me, patients with NMO, MOGAD, and MS that are African-American and Hispanics, they live in 1983, or actually 1984, right? Because if you, nobody knows about you, it's like no, no, there is no treatment for you. And the concept of access, actually, it's not just showing up in the doctor's office. It's also the concept of agency. How am I going to be able to go to when I feel that there is a need to, right? And now, by the way, if I have three jobs, like many of my patients, or I'm homeless, my agency is gone. So we need to be compassionate. And by the way, if you're a doctor, it is important to be um, having a uh, health equity training during your medical school, and the Yukon Health has that component included in, during the medical school training. Otherwise, 
um, you know, people are very dismissive. To, just to make a last point, there is a nice paper by people here in Mass General, uh, a survey about patients with NMO that, were, that are African Americans, uh, and they were dismissed. You know, this is all in your head. And that patient delayed her care for about a year and a half. So it's, how, it's on us, but also it's on, it's on us as a community, because before I am a doctor, a teacher, a scientist, I'm also a patient myself. Thank you so much. That's, it's, it's great to hear everything that's happening um, you know, to forward things as it relates to health equity. Um, I just thought about something as you were speaking, um, Dr. Imatola, uh, about you know, just a personal story that I will share. Um, so I've been living in Boston for six years now, but prior to moving here, I was actually living in Tennessee, and I was doing some consulting work which meant that I didn't have insurance through a, a corporation or organization. I was just, you know, paying out of pocket. And quite frankly, I wasn't thinking about insurance because nothing was wrong with me. So I was, you know, who thinks about insurance until you really need insurance? So I was working and I started to experience um, severe um, pain in my back along my spine. Um, now that I think about it in retrospect, I think that um, I was starting to present symptoms then. So this was, I moved to Boston in 2018. So this was around like the summer of uh, 2017. And I went, I remember going to uh, visit, uh, you know, a pain doctor, a, a back specialist in Tennessee. Um, and I walked into the office to see the doctor and obviously they, they knew, you know, I didn't have insurance. So, I, you know, that just kind of put me in a different category in terms of those of us that have walked in and, and uh, to seek treatment and didn't have insurance. You probably can understand kind of what, what the experience is like. And so the doctor was, you know, very dismissive. It's, you know, it's just back pain. It's nothing, you know, if you want to go see a, another chiropractor, et cetera. And so um, I walked away without, you know, any uh, treatment. Uh, plan in place or, uh, you know, he didn't, you know, order an MRI or any of that. And so, um, you know, I continued for months and I usually, you know, I'm a person, I kind of sleep in the fetal position and um, my pain was so severe that I could not sleep while with my legs bent. It, it was just, you know, it was just a pain that I, I can't even describe. It was just unbearable. I ended up going to see another doctor in Tennessee, and again, I think this doctor actually said that she saw uh, maybe I had um, cysts along my spine. She said, "I, you know, I don't think it's anything to be too concerned about. I think it's benign, um, but, you know, if you want to look into the type of cysts, she told me that there were Tarloff cysts, so I was, like, Googling this type of cysts. I found a specialist in Texas. I was like, oh, do I need to move to Texas? Um, and so... The long story short to that is when I walked into, I remember that doctor specifically telling me that she said, you know, it's interesting because when I did a series of tests on you, you know, you, you kind of presented symptoms where I thought it might be MS, but um, she actually did order an MRI. She said, but when I looked at your MRI, it doesn't appear to be MS. So, you know, in my mind, I don't think the doctor knew about NMO. And as a result of that, uh, she said, you know, I think it's some cysts that you might have along your spine. You're going to be fine. Nothing to be worried about. So, you know, again, I was checked out of that uh, out of that office and moved, you know, and for a year just endured pain, you know, until one day I was actually in my bed. And I remember it felt like someone shocked me and it, it, it literally like a jolt of pain. And I, it just kind of went through my body. And again, it's one of those things where people always say, listen to your body. And, you know, if something's happening with your body, go seek medical attention. And, you know, at the time I didn't because I thought, I mean, there can't, nothing's really wrong with me. I've seen two doctors. So it just goes back to, you know, it, depending on, you know, where you are. And I just want to ask the, the doctors, you know, based on your experience, I know there are lots of great things happening here um, in, in New England. What would you say to someone who is in another state where, you know, Maybe they don't have great doctors who are um, familiar with NMO or, you know, I, you know, am fortunate now to have and I would be remiss if I didn't recognize my neurologist who is here, who she probably couldn't say anything because of HIPAA when she was on stage. But I can I can tell you who she is. So, Dr. Martine, is she still here? 
Yes, that's my neurologist, everyone. Yes, you can clap for her. She is, she is a godsend to me. She's amazing. She's the first person that ever told me when I was in the ICU, she came and stood by my bedside. She grabbed my hand and she said, you're going to be okay. You're going to get through this. She was the first person that ever told me that. And her level of sincerity, you know, the way that she communicated that to me, I actually believed her. And I held on that, and I continue to hold on to that every day of this NMO journey. And I love her to pieces, and she knows that. And even though I'm going to be moving in a few months, I'm still going to stalk her. And, yeah, so I love my neurologist. But I want to just turn it back to the doctors to say, what if that's not your case? And you don't live in a place where you have great care. What would you say to patients? Yeah, so this is actually an excellent question. And the reality in, in the United States there are places that are neurology deserts. You know, if you live 60 miles from a city, you are in trouble. You don't see any kind of uh, place to buy groceries, nor doctors, etc. cetera. So the, there are several organizations that are working on this. Uh, the MS Society, it's not just the MS Society, by the way. The MS Society umbrella uh, uh, diseases are NMO, MOGAT, and MS. So the MS Society has a website that is active 24 hours a day, um, and you can go there and actually find people that work uh, along the MS Society as a partners of care, or they are comprehensive centers for MS. The same happens with the CMSE, uh, that is the consortium for MS centers in the, in the United States and others. Uh, they have a, a directory and that you can go and find the doctor that is close to you. And if everything fails, well, you can call me, and you can email me, and you can uh, Google me, and then find, because our, our um, to, to your point, our responsibility as a providers, uh, MS neurologists in the country, that's what we build networks, is to take patients from diagnosis to early treatment, actually, even better, from prodrome, to diagnosis, to early treatment in less than two months. That's the goal, right? If that's not uh, accomplished, then we increase the risk of having a severe disability. All of this resonates, and I would say you're not alone. That's what I would tell someone looking for answers and looking for the doctor, just like you eventually found. Um, if you don't have a primary care doctor that you trust, and that you feel is your right arm, look for someone else. And I say this because that primary care doctor should be your ally, should be your advocate, should be that person helping you navigate this broken healthcare system. So make sure you have a really outstanding primary care doctor who also is willing to learn about what's going on with your health and what resources may be available. We've talked about neurologists, but part of the equation is also not neurologists, like physical therapists, um, like Nat mentioned, um, speech therapists, occupational therapists. Um, a lot of the patient organizations have um, directories of people who may be closer to you. A lot of the times, groups like this, word gets out. You can ask people, who do you see? Who have you had luck with? And so it's very powerful to be part of support organizations where word can spread on who's, who's good to see, how can I get connected with them? Um, I do think telehealth is here to stay and will only get better from where we are. Um, if you're in a place where there's a neurology desert, where there may not be access to the latest therapies, a lot of places, including Mass General Brigham, have access to second opinion um, consultations, including by paper. You don't necessarily even have to come in person, but send your records and get an expert to review them and give opinions on, on how could that care be better. Um, so lots more there, but I, I, I think that the, the most important message is remember that you're not alone. If it's not your primary care, uh, it may be people in your life, friends, family, who also are navigating this journey, who, who will be, you know, part of the people who make that plan happen for you. If, if I may add, um, you know, all of us that are diagnosed with a disease and all of you are ambassadors for change. You already have the collective experience. You can help your loved ones. 
You can help others as well with that collective experience that you have. So don't be shy. I think that people appreciate that. Uh, for instance, I have patients that are uh, advocates. They work and they are uh, having uh, support groups and they help others. Uh, that's an important thing. So the building of the community to fix the broken um, health system of the United States requires more than indifference. Because at the end of the day, it's interesting, right? So you see the compassion here. You sometimes go to the AD, you don't see it there, right? Because people are hurried, they are dismissive, they have bias, etc. So the, how people can be empowered, you can empower yourself through your experience, through your resilience as well. And knowing a little bit and finding that trusted individual in your life. The primary care doctor is one, also the physician is one, right? So, I mean, one of the main issues that we have as a barrier is the trust. You know, African-American and Hispanics, uh, they don't participate in clinical trials in MS, MOGAD, and NMO because they don't trust anyone until you explain and you take the time. As I mentioned to you, Many of the things that we don't do is because we don't use discretionary efforts. And medicine is all about discretionary efforts. Everything in medicine is discretionary. The medicine that this value, the concept of value of care is discretionary. You can spend 10 more minutes with a patient, but you will change their trajectory if they have more God. You know, I can tell you, I, I have a, a family that touched me, it's a, uh, diagnosed in 2015, 51-year-old woman uh, coming in with um, NMO, SD, NMO, uh, acoporin-4, uh, having four attacks that were treated in, in a not an appropriate way. What do you think is going to happen with that patient? She's in the, she's in the wheelchair. She's in the gurney, right? She, don't, she, she cannot see. She cannot walk. And we could have avoided that in a country that is, is like our country, right? So this is not the middle of nowhere. This is the United States of America. Uh, thank you so much, uh, doctors, for, for sharing that. Now, I just want to turn this over to um, our patient panelists. And Nat, I want to start with you. Um, we are sharing the stage with some um, extraordinary uh, pioneers in their fields, the doctors that we have, and also other doctors that are here. What um, would you like to share just about your journey um, as a patient as it relates to uh, disparities, uh, inequalities, or um, just equity challenges that might help the providers um, kind of shift gears in a better direction that, you know, would contribute to um, better outcomes for patients? Yeah, well, in Mexico, it works very differently. Um, you have need to have insurance to get to the right doctors. Because if you don't, you end up in the public health care system and you're probably not going to find anyone there. So I think it's very important for doctors to be open and to talk more about it because this is a way that we can yeah, talk to, for example, in, in here we can talk to experts and learn more. This patient day is amazing because... For me, being from another country to come here and learn more about my disease. And I've learned things that I haven't learned in Mexico with my neurologist. And she's amazing and she's great and she has an amazing team. But I think being here, it makes a difference. Um, well, let me see. I, I have a great neurologist, um, and I mean, I live in Boston, so the healthcare is pretty good. I mean, besides coming across certain situations where, you know, like I said, unconscious bias does exist, I would say just as far as like navigating the healthcare system as a person of color, just make sure you're educated as much as possible because you will have to fight for, you know, what you feel is right. Like uh, I mentioned before, you have to advocate for yourself. You have to use your voice and, you know, just, just believe in yourself. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I know we are getting uh, close to uh, the end of the panel. So before I, I do want to, I think at the very end, I am going to ask one last thing of the doctors uh, to share. But, but before we do that, um, I'll just pause here for any questions that we have. Um, So just a comment for people in the room that may not know this, I know many of the doctors do. Uh, we commissioned some research by uh, Dr. Farron Briggs. He's a PhD researcher. He's now at University of Miami. He had access to uh, around 28 million electronic medical records, and he looked at the incidence rate of NMOSD, and we can do that because there's an ICD-10 code for NMOSD, and he found that the prevalence for African-American women was 2.6 times the incidence rate for Caucasian women, white women, in the USA, and uh, Asian American women were intermediate between those two groups. So, you know, we realized that NMOSD in particular hits uh, some of the minority populations much harder, and so we, we think that's a, a huge unaddressed need. As we've heard, the challenges to health access, health equity are significant. So we formed a coalition for health equity. We're working on this. Um, the challenge is it's a rare disease, and we're a small, small uh, foundation, small patient group, but we're trying to find a way to make a difference. I think the neurology deserts, we've, we've seen that, and, you know, it's, it's a desert of neurologists in many parts of the USA, but also specialists that know NMOSD and MOGAD. You know, oftentimes the neurologist is doing many things. They may not really have any NMOSD patients under their care. So I'd love to ask the doctors, what would you suggest, we as a foundation with this community we have, what, would, what should we work on, given that we're a small, rare disease-focused organization? What would you prioritize for us? This is phenomenal. I'm so happy to hear of your efforts. And I think the fact that you've structurally included a to this topic today and brought a diversity of speakers and a diversity of participants, that speaks volumes. So I, I applaud you for that. Um, my answer is, is a little bit sideways. I would put together a committee, a group of patients who identify as black, Latino, Native American, who maybe live in those neurology deserts, who have other barriers to getting the best possible care. Ask them. Have them guide you and hold you accountable. That's what I would suggest. Yeah, so that's great. Uh, in addition to that, I think that the answers can come from other experiences, right? So if you look at the MS Society, the CMNC, we are all in the same boat trying to change that the outcomes. Um, so I, I, I will say to you that one of the most important outcomes that we need to change is awareness, right? So um, our group uh, published a recent paper in MSJ, the Multiple Sclerosis Journal, about uh, early warning signs of MS, NMO, uh, MOGAD. And those um, early warning signs actually are uh, addressed to medical students. So we need to start from the beginning to teach medical students how to diagnose or at least how to raise awareness. And then the patients. Again, self-agency is crucial. Somebody, you, you have cell agency, right? So you change your outcome. So we think that it's important that, uh, you know, th let me tell you something interesting. If you can own a smartphone, you have cell agency, right? So I have actually made this survey, it's an informal survey. 90% of my patients that are African-American, Hispanics, even homeless, own a cell phone. So you, they are not digitally homeless. They can actually, you know, find information. So my point to you is that awareness in uh, the patients is important because if your doctor doesn't address you, you can call anyone and say, you know, I, I need a referral, and that's the way that some people get to me. So I, I don't trust this doctor. I don't like him. He was dismissive. He spent five minutes with me, and then he goes to this ex-doctor, or Dr. Cabana, or Trimitola, and then they come to me. I mean, in addition, we have networks of experts in the country you know, that you can work with. So in addition to what Dr. Mejia said, I mean, patients know what they want. It's important to include them in every decision that we, that we have about uh, the future of the liberal care. 
Thank you very much for the advice. I just want to say we do have a coalition Love form. This. 30 <laughs> doctors and patients, over 30 and growing, including many doctors that are working on health equity in the neurology space, people like Dr. Liliana Amesqua, Dr. Macy Joy Williams, many others. And uh, But we, we take your message to heart. It's great advice. I, I love that. I love that. I, I'd say as a, I, I mainly care for people living with Parkinson's disease. And uh, one of the foundations, um, Michael J. Fox Foundation, actually, they did something really phenomenal a couple years ago around giving small grants for people um, leading health equity efforts. That's, I think, another big gap. There's physicians, there's patients, there's other advocates wanting to do the work. Very few people fund. Um, yeah. And that might be a nice model to look into. Um, and I just wanted to add to what Michael said and you know, to what you all are all saying. As part of our coalition, we understand that a huge responsibility for us as an organization that's sort of leading this effort is so much of it is just listening and learning. Mm -hmm. And I think we live in a world where everyone just loves to talk so much and hear themselves talk. But we sometimes we just need to step back and listen and learn mm -hmm. from these lived experiences and stop assuming that we, we know how to do everything and we have the best solution. So I just wanted to add that. But Michael has one more thing. Uh, Samara went to Mexico, but we gave a small grant to Dr. Jose Flores in Mexico City uh, to do some research, and he came back to us and said, look, I apologize, but I took $5,000 and I tested uh, 200 patients that I suspected had NMOSD or MOGAD, but uh, they were uninsured, like 70, 80 percent of the population, and I couldn't afford to test them. But with this money, I tested them. I found 125 new NMOSD and MOGAD patients. So now these people have diagnoses. And by the way, that's an issue in the US too, in these neurology deserts we're talking about, access to testing, getting the right tests, that's also hard to do. So we wanna keep working on this, but we're gonna follow up with both, everyone here on this panel. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, I do believe that's our time uh, for this panel. This has been incredible. I'm, I, I wanna go on and on and on just with lots of questions, but I'm glad that we now have your contact information. We know how to find you and thank you so much for just sharing to the patients. Thank you. And, and also to, uh, to the doctors on the panel. Let's give them a round of applause for their contribution to thank this you. panel.